Good afternoon, everyone. I am C. A. Rana Tehlani, moderator for the afternoon. We CPE are delighted to welcome you to the webinar on overview of business valuation and role of CAs in MSME sector. <clears throat> we will be starting the webinar in a short while. Meanwhile, let me appraise you about the CPE committee. Dear members, as the role of chartered accountants is evolving continuously in today's global dynamic world, our need of the hour is to innovate as per the requisite requisites of the contemporary business environment and upgrade the education system and curriculum of the chartered accountancy course. The CPE's committee, CPE's committee is organizing the seminars, webinars, and national conferences on a continuous basis to upgrade the training and provide guidance to the members so that they can look forward beyond the traditional practice areas and explore new areas for business and profession. Ladies and gentlemen, before starting the webinar, I would like to welcome our respected chairman of CPE committee, Sri Purshottam Khandelwalji. Dear sir, is the chairman of the committee and he's a vice chairman of the committee for members in entrepreneurship and public service. This, and he's a convener of RBA Directorate of ICI. Sir is having 25 years of post-qualification experience in the field of audit, direct tax and indirect tax and intellectual property rights. This year, he is devoted in fortifying CPE's framework and guaranteeing quality across its entire operational spectrum. This year, the major focus of CPE would be on upgrading the CPE portal for enhancement of the branding and professional competency of members. Welcome, sir. Please share with us a few words of wisdom. Good afternoon, respected faculties for these two sessions, Nitin Mehta ji and Swamil Sangvi ji. Uh, moderator of this session, Reina, Reina ji, my office of CPE committee, Payal ji, and respected members, those who are viewing this seminar. <clears throat> Currently, I am heading the CPE committee, which is the mother of all the committee. Institute is celebrating 75th year of inception. Vishwas ke pichatar sal. In this 75th year, ICI has given a lot of to the stakeholder. The Prime Minister rightly said that the signature of Prime Minister of this country uh, is uh, not more power than the signature of Prime Minister. Uh, chartered accountant. So, that, that says the signature of chartered accountant carry more power than the signature of prime minister of this country. So this is a very important uh, function given by the parliament. Whenever and whatever you carried out the financial attestation function, it is very important for you to first you believe in that function and then you carried out the signature. So you are the very important part. Recently, I met to the Yogi Adityanath and they said that the, we are the major contributor in the Indian economy which is the dream project of the Narendra Modi for the five trillion economy. So without a contribution of chartered accountant, it is not possible to, to develop any country because what we are doing, we are doing uh, any businessmen to the industries. We are providing our financial services, auditing services and uh, attestation function. So uh, my humble request to all the members to please upgrade your knowledge. Because what we are selling, we are selling our knowledge, we are selling our services. So first of all, you, you have to update at any times. So my committee is dedicated to upgrade the knowledge of members in, in any forms. This year, we have organized a lot of conference, seminar, webinars across the country. And this particular year, uh, this month, Ajit Naji is aware that we organized a program from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. In the whole month, they are full busy with these uh, conferences. So, uh, because this is the rolling period, we have this year, there is no rolling period and you have to complete CP and this, this calendar in only. So please attend in the large number. And this year we are sending emails to each and every member at the end of the month that that much uh, CP you have completed and this, this much is pending. So we are uh, 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 regularly updating the member also. I will not take much of a time. So I'm always uh, thankful to both the speakers. Both are young and dynamic. Nitin Bhai is doing regularly practice in the Gujarat High Court and Swamil is a very dynamic in the business um, merchant and acquisitions. So uh, the today's 
my best wishes to the success of this seminar thank you so much thank you sir for inspiring us to upgrade ourselves thank you so much business valuations in today's era have been very common and frequent on occasions like mergers and acquisitions sales and various regulatory requirements as per the laws and even the accounting standards requires business valuation to enlighten our minds further on the topic we welcome mr somil singhvi to uh, as our distinguished guest who is also air 30 and he has been continuously practice in the area of business valuations transaction advisory services and international taxation he has uh, provided various training sessions on various platforms ca somil singhvi singhvi sir we welcome you for joining us and over to you sir thank you very much thank you anna ji thank you pushatam sir uh, other speaker mr nitin mehta and uh, everyone uh, who is listening to me here on this uh, occasion uh, very well welcome to my session so i believe i'll share my screen <coughs> so i believe everyone must be thirsty right uh, post lunch session hai, and i believe uh, everyone had their lunch and now everyone might be thirsty so i have something to offer for you a bottle uh right so uh, if i offer you a bottle how much will you pay for me pay for me right uh this up big jokes apart dekh sakte hai ki ek bottle hai a uh, bottle might cost you rupees 20 in uh, normal transactions like agar homogeneous market hai if there is a homogeneous market and you are paying for a bottle then it might cost you rupees 20 but suppose if i tw twist this example and uh, say that if you are uh, hiking a mountain and you are there on the mountain at some 1000 feet then how much will you pay for this bottle maybe rupees 50 and suppose if i change this example again and i say uh, you are in the midst of a desert uh, where there is no water available to you since uh, in long distances then how much will be you will be ready to pay for this bottle i believe uh, whatever the amount you have or uh, 1000 2000 or if you are extremely thirsty then you might pay whatever you have to buy this bottle and uh, quench your thirst so this is what is a value a valuation we talk about a uh, so valuation warren buffet has said a very beautiful sentence price is what you pay and value is what you get that means a transaction whatever you are paying is a price but value has economic substance and the value which you get the the in this example like if you are quenching your thirst then that value that you get by quenching your thirst is something different so i have tried to highlight the difference between price and value and will understand a concept so price is what price by definition means amount of money or other means of consideration that you have paid for an asset aap ek asset ko acquire karne ke liye whatever you have paid is what you call a price so price is what an ex post measure an outcome of the transaction so in this example what we have taken you paid rupees 20 suppose if you are in a city like uh, mumbai or bangalore where the bottles are easily available you might pay rupees 20 for this bottle and suppose if you are in a mountainous area you might pay 50 or 100 rupees for this bottle so the price is the exact measure or the outcome of the transaction that you are going to pay for this an asset and price may have a relationship or may not have the relationship with the value so the value that you are going to get from this bottle might be different from the price so in the in the difference also i have highlighted uh, value is not precisely measurable value can be different from what you are paying price can be pre um, measured precisely value is not a static figure uh, it can be variable uh, like Uh, we will discuss it further but price is a static figure like what you are paying for the price and value is a measure of economic value uh, economic value by that i mean 
like demand supply or the production. So depending on the economic factors, how much is the demand and how much is the supply is the value. And price may or may not take consider the, and it may consider a non-economic substance as well, like branding ho gaya, uh, or the socio-economic factors that might vary the price. This, uh, this, in our example, for this like, bottle, you are paying 20. Or for some other bottle of different brand, you might pay 30 rupees. So every, every company has its own brand value and accordingly it may vary the price. So understanding or delving more into valuation concept, like valuation is a procedure or technique of estimating of value of an asset at a stated time and for a specific purpose. Like in our example that we are considering right now, the bottles example, the value of a bottle is different in different stages. Like you might pay 20 rupees in a city or you might pay thousands of rupees in a desert where you don't get water. So at a particular point of time, at a stated time and for a specific value, uh, the value might be different for the asset. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, if we come to a real life scenarios wherein uh, the some suppose a startup had a certain value or it has been agreed at a certain valuation before pandemic and after pandemic, the valuation might have changed for that startup. Uh, if we consider the the tech companies or the other startups as well. So the pandemic has created or has been a, such a factor which changed the valuation of a startup or maybe some other companies as well. So valuation has to be seen at a particular time, at a, at a specific purpose or in for a specified asset. Uh, we discussed that valuation a value from economic or commercial perspective that we discussed the it has uh, economic like demand and supply thing. Valuation is not a science, but it's an art. Uh, though we take num number of figures or number crunching we do in the valuation, but it is based on the subjective judgment. There are various factors in the valuation uh, like terminal value or the discount rate or the future growth rate that you are going to predict. So if, if these, these are all subjective based on the transaction or based on the judgment of a valuer. So it is not that, that it is a, a, a proper numbers, or, but it is an art of valuing a thing. And valuation is not a precise number. I can't say valuation of this particular uh, company is 5 crores, 42 lakhs, 57,353 rupees. It can't be that specific. Uh, it is generally in a range. A range, like it may be ranging of five to six crores, or a particular range that you can define for a uh, for an asset or for a company. And valuation gets impacted by the external developments. Uh, like for example, in our uh, real life scenario, if we take the uh, crypto or the gaming industry, uh, with the advent of uh, retrospective GST amendments and the uh, income tax. At uh, getting applicable or the notices receiving, uh, the valuation of the gaming companies have dropped drastically. So, uh, political developments or regulatory developments may impact the valuation of a company. So, why valuations? Uh, we we heard valuation in routine life, uh, we read in the papers or we read in the, we see in the news channels as well. So why valuations are required and what are the various areas where valuation are generally required? Uh, I have I've tried to categorize into four parts, uh, deal-related, regulatory, financial reporting and others, miscellaneous. So deal-related valuations can be in maybe purchase or sale of business. For example, like, uh, recent case of mankind pharma where the ownership has been changed. So that th this can be a case or like yesterday, Bain decided to liquidate 1.1% in uh, Axis Bank. So this can be a deal related transaction, a merger or demerger, like Borussel decided to demerge its scientific entity. So this can be a demerger case wherein there is a valuation required to value that demerged entity as well. Uh, for a JV, 
uh, entry and exit at the point of entering some if uh, uh, if two companies are entering into a JV at that time valuation may be required like or at the time of exit if the if one of the company want to get exit uh, from the JV then what is the valuation or what are the total uh, assets that 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 needs to be considered in the valuation will be done and but always for the fundraising purpose like SME IPOs, main board IPOs, or private equity placements as well. So wherever the fundraising activities are required, generally investors and the investee uh, asks for the valuation to the right valuation so that the right price can be paid for that transaction. Uh, second category is regulatory purpose. Uh, RBI, FEMA. Uh, so whenever the non-resident is acquiring certain stake in a resident company like in India, or if there is change of uh, shareholding pattern from resident to non-resident or vice versa, we require a valuation in FEMA RBI purpose. Uh, income tax, we all know in rule 11 UA, we need a valuation of a company. Uh, in Companies Act, uh, under section 247, so Companies Act has mandated to, to have a valuation of a registered valuer in case of fresh issue of equity shares. Uh, in SEBI, uh, in fairness opinion, or maybe delisting of shares, at that time, valuations are required in SEBI. And IBC, a new age term, um, sab sun, sun hai. Uh, different class of assets, valuations are required, uh, like plant and machinery, land and building, uh, securities and financial assets. So different class of assets are required to be valued when a company goes into insolvency in under IBC rulings. Uh, Third category is financial reporting. Uh, like in India's, we require the valuation for fair, fair value under India's 113 or uh, for impairment of assets like under India's 36. So in the financial reporting perspective as well, we require the valuation to be done for the assets and the company. And there's a miscellaneous cases like family settlement, litigations, a sweat equity. Sweat equity is a general term wherein if you are planning to hire a consultant in your company or maybe a, in, in any other company where there's a consulting, consultant getting engaged or some third person is getting in, engaged where you need to give him equity stake in the company, at that time sweat equity comes into picture. And intangible valuation, brand valuation, goodwill valuation, in, in such cases we require valuations. So uh, we discussed these terms, but uh, citing it again, prices is equal to value under fair market conditions. But as we discussed, suppose in, if you are in a city of Mumbai or Surat or Bangalore, wherever you may be, so the value which you are getting from that product, like in our case of uh, Bisleri bottle, and the price which you are going to pay is almost same. So because you will get the similar bottle or the similar kind of uh, water uh, in a different brand. So there's and second, there's a concept of risk and risk-free rate of return. Uh, risk-free rate of return, in simple terms, if I explain you, it's a government bond. So uh, there are government government bonds available in the market. So these bonds are considered as risk-free. The returns which we get from these bonds are risk-free. Uh, and when we add, uh, there are corporate bonds available as well, or there is uh, equity dilution, everything. So uh, the, any other returns which we get other than these government bonds are have does have the element of riskiness attached to it. Uh, this risk, if I classify, can be considered as a liquidity risk or credit risk or interest risk. And every company itself has risk factors, which we call as unsystematic risk factors. So the company, uh, every company has its own risk, which we term as unsystematic risk factors. And the value that we derive of a business, if it's a going concern, that that is including of both tangible assets and intangible assets. Like suppose if we derive a valuation by DCF approach, we'll discuss DCF later, but the enterprise value that we derive by an approach, uh, income approach, includes the valuation of tangible assets and the intangible assets. In fact, in market multiples or market approach methods as well, the valuation, the enterprise value that we derive 
is of both tangible and intangible assets. And equity value is what? Business enterprise value. So business enterprise value in, includes the value of both equity shareholders, all the security holders, I would summarize. So equity, debt, debt shareholders, everyone who are the stakeholders in the company. And the value that we derive is the enterprise value. And if it gets reduced by debt, if we reduce the debt from the enterprise value, we get the equity value. Now, the equity value for the equity shareholders. This includes both uh, equity shareholders and the preference shareholders as well. Uh, now, coming to the next part, these there is another terminology or uh, concept I try to explain. Levels of value. Uh, levels of value can depend on your strategic decision making, the controls over the cash flows, or the liquidity. Now, suppose if we have valued a company by discounted cash flow, this DCF approach, uh, and for the financial controlling basis, we have applied a value. We, if if there's a strategic premium involved, I mean, if if the purchaser, the acquirer or the investor is get, getting a strategic decision-making power, he might add certain premium to that and he'll reduce the risk factor against that. So that, that so if a strategic premium gets added, so the value of that company increase gets increased for him and he gets the strategic control business. So this is strategic decision-making. So we're talking about the levels uh, wherein valuation can differ from in a similar case as well. Uh, suppose now suppose uh, if you do if you're not getting the control, then the risk factor for you will be a little higher, and we need to discount for that. We need to add risk factor for that. So we add a discount for lack of controls. In case of companies, marketable uh, securities. Uh, the listed entities uh, where we, we get the minority stakeholding in the company. So uh, that, that is a different stage of valuation and uh, we need to discount for that factor. And suppose if you are acquiring a stake in a private limited company, which is not listed. So we need to discount for the lack of marketability as well. So uh, that means we need to add riskiness to, to, to our uh, valuation and we need to discount it by more uh, return uh, risk free uh, risk rates to uh, reduce the value for that. So the valuation may be different at um, for a different purpose for a similar company or for a similar transaction, depending on what we are getting from that investment. Uh, I hope I am clear on this. Uh, continuing with the previous levels of value. Now, the basis of value. There are three principles against, again in this. A fair value, participant-specific value, and liquidation value. So, uh, fair value is what? Uh, in an orderly transaction, assume, uh, where there are equal number of buyers and there are equal number of sellers, uh, the value which is received for an asset or if the liability is to be transferred, whatever the value that is derived is a fair value because there's an orderly transaction and there are equal number of buyers and the sellers available. Uh, second point is participant specific value. Now, if you're valuing a company or a transaction uh, for which an investor or the acquirer has specific advantages of acquiring that company, like if he's creating any synergy, uh, if I talk about some example, like in a textile industry, if there is a trader and if he's going to acquire a manufacturer of a machinery, then it will create a synergy because he can uh, manufacture himself and sell off the product by trading it. So that creates a synergy. So there's a element of synergy in that. So that valuation or the price which he's going to pay for that company might be higher than a fair value. So that is participant specific value. And third is liquidation value. Now liquidation value is what? Uh, liquidation value uh, in a general way, when 
when the company is into liquidation or we need to sell us sell an asset uh, which uh, which can be easily replaceable at that time the liquidation value is to be done and liquidation value includes only the cost of assets and it has been reduced by the cost of disposable as well so liquidation in general in case when the business gets terminated or the assets are, are to be liquidated at that time we use the liquidation value uh, we'll come to the concept of cost approach in the later stage and i'll explain you uh, more about that now there's another term of relative valuation uh, as i as you can see a classic example of orange and apple i have put in here like both are similar relative valuation uh, before entering into, into this example so relative valuation is what when when we are planning to compare a company or a transaction with a similar kind of transaction so this is what the example of orange and apple comes in like uh, if we are trying to value a company by relative valuation like there are similarities between this orange and apple like both are fruits both are of almost same weight uh, both have acidic factor orange might have more acidic factor uh, apple has less acidic factor both are similar in shape so these are kind of similarities and if we talk about the differences then this is one is in orange color and another is in red color uh, the shape of apple is little bit different uh, from the shape of orange so in real relative valuation as well uh, when we are valuing a company in that case uh, if if we try to find out the comparables then we try to look at ev upon ebitda multiple rise upon earning ratios pb ratios ps ratios so there are multiple ratios available and we try to compare similar size company uh, or the similar multiple company with our with the company which we are valuing and try to put up a valuation for the company which we are trying to value so these data might be available in public domain of the listed or quoted shares and sometimes if these are not available then there are databases to find out uh, wherein you can find these uh, multiples so uh, this is this is what is relative valuation all about um, now coming to the second part of the presentation uh, so there are various approaches in valuation uh, i'll try to brief you about the different approaches uh, so practically there are only three approaches and there are various methodologies to value under these approaches in universe at global level there are only three approaches and there cannot be fourth approach uh, income approach market approach and cost approach now we, when we take the market approach first market approach uh, as we discussed in relative valuation considers the ratios to be used in valuing a company there are again two methodologies a comparable companies multiple or comparable transaction multiple uh, as we discussed uh, the ratios are to be evaluated in this in each and every case and look for the similarities wherein where the similar companies can be used for the valuation or uh, like in comparable companies multiple method or it is also this guideline public company method uh, in this case uh, we try to take the quoted equity shares or the in simple terms the entities which are listed or the companies which are listed we try to take the ratios of that company or or the uh, various factors like ebitda profit after tax sales book value uh, ebit so we try to take or we try to find out the companies which are of similar nature have the similar ratios and we try to put up the multiple for that of you use multiple of that company and put up in our valuation scenarios so that we can value our company so this is a comparable company method wherein in general case we use the uh, details of the listed entities now in comparable transaction multiple method uh, also known as guideline transaction method uh, we try to value an asset based on a transaction that has happened uh, in the past maybe in the same company or maybe in the different company 
like suppose a similar kind of company has been acquired for say about 40 crores then 40 crore ka valuation if what trans and we try to put that transaction and uh, value our company in a similar fashion and if required we add a discount for lack of marketability or maybe some some other discounts or factors as well but generally the transaction multiple happens if the similar transaction has happened in a similar kind of industry in some past date uh, coming to the second approach and one of the most important approaches income approach uh, in, in income approach there are various methods discounted cash flow relief from royalty multi period earnings method within without more method option pricing but discounted cash flow has more weightage. Other, others are used for valuing intangible assets, but discounted cash flow is generally used to measure a company, to measure the enterprise value of a company. Now, what does it consider? Uh, discounted cash flow, if I deep dive more into that, so generally we take the uh, future cash flows of the company say suppose five years, seven years, or 10 years, whatever it may be, we, we take the future cash flows of the company. Now by cash flows, uh, I mean, whatever the revenue the company has, less whatever the expenses, uh, adjusting the factors of depreciation, interest, income tax, capital expenditure, whatever the net cash flow we get, the free cash flow that, that we get uh, are used in the discounting cash flow model to discount and to derive a value. So I've tried to highlight the various terminologies uh, here. So cash flow is what the operating finance, financing and investment cash flows. Uh, the free cash flows, the point number six in this case, uh, the way that we discussed, uh, reducing all the expenses, adjusting it with interest, depreciation, uh, taxation, income tax, uh, capital expenditure, the net uh, cash flows that we get for a particular financial year is free cash flow. Uh, second is discount rate. Now, whatever fee, free cash flow that we have derived, we discount, the, we call these as future cash flows. Now, we discount these future cash flows with a particular discount rate. Now, this discount rate uh, is arrived by a back procedure. So, uh, the seventh number point, weighted average cost of capital. Uh, we derive the discount rate by weighted average cost of capital method or there are different methods wherein we use uh, the uh, KPM model of for equity and for debt and we derive a combined discounting factor or the riskiness of that company to discount it to the present value. Uh, present value, third point is present value. The present value is the, uh, the whatever the value that we get after discounting it with the back or discount rate of the future cash flow is the present value. The fourth comes the net present value. Net present value is the summation of all the future cash flows. Uh, like year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, whatever years that we have considered, the summation of all the uh, uh, cash flows, maybe positive or negative, is what is the net present value uh, when discounted to the current financial year. Uh, terminal value, uh, again an important term. So. Uh, we assume or we predict that the business is going to be a growing concern uh, in valuation. For, uh, if you are predicting that, that the company is going to be a growing concern, then in that case, uh, we use the terminal value concept wherein we try to predict the value of a company till infinity uh, by using Gordon's model. Uh, there are different uh, three-stage models. So there are various models to derive that. But for that, we derive a terminal value and that terminal value is added uh, after discounting to the uh, present cash flows. Uh, maybe if suppose after five years of projections, we have considered a terminal value. Uh, 
like fertile infinity. Now that terminal value is being added after discounting. We discount it with the current discount rate and add it to the uh, present value of all the free cash flows. So that becomes uh, the terminal value plus all the free cash flows addition will become the enterprise value. The last point, the enterprise value is what? The final outcome of the valuation of both equity stakeholders and the debt stakeholders. Uh, now, if we reduce the debt component from the enterprise value, we get the equity value. I hope I'm clear on this uh, points. Yes, sir, you are clear. Please pro proceed. Right. Um, now comes the intangible asset valuation methods, uh, relief from royalty method. Uh, so in this case, we tried to put up the valuation, um, like generally this case is used in trademarks or license, wherein we tried to derive a value considering the royalty. Uh, suppose if we had that royalty or we, we know how to, uh, we had that trademark in our company and we value that company. And suppose uh, if we had to pay for that trademark, of for the license, then how much royalty fees we might pay uh, till its finite number of years. Like suppose if if the royalty period is of 10 years, then if, if we pay for that royalty, say suppose one lakh rupees a year, so we, we might end up paying 12 lakh rupees or sorry, 10 lakh rupees in 10 years and when discounting, discounted to the present value. So that, that difference or that value uh, if, if in case the royalty would have been in-house, the both the difference of both the cash flows in the present value is considered to be the royalty method of valuation and we term it as relief from royalty method. Uh, Multi-period excess earning method, more or less of similar kind. Uh, we try to estimate the future cash flows of the company based on the intangible asset. Uh, if intangible asset hai in that company, and if it is not there, then what will be the difference in that? Uh, suppose, for example, in a snack industry, if I say, if, if there's a particular snacking, uh, which without a label or without a brand might cost you rupees 50, and with the brand logo on it, it might cost you rupees 100. So this 50 rupees becomes an intangible value. Now, how long that brand is going to be beneficial, maybe infinity or maybe 10 years, we try to factor that excess earning uh, and bring it to the present value. That becomes a multi-period excess earning method. Uh, the third is with and without method. Uh, again, so of the similar kind, wherein we try to value in time, uh, uh, considering the business cash flows, including intangible assets, and without the intangible assets. The difference between that becomes the value of and that intangible asset. Now the fourth comes is the option pricing, uh, like ESOPs or the sweat equity, uh, wherein there's an option attached to the uh, share, or the, when we try to value an option. So this becomes an option pricing model. Uh, Majorly two methods are uh, there in this, Black and Scholes and Binomial. There is Black Scholes and Merton method as well, but uh, primarily these two methods are used to do an option pricing model. Uh, various factors that to be considered in this uh, model are the strike price or the current price, the exercise price, uh, life, of, life of the option, like how the option is going to be valid. Like in suppose we take an example of ESOPs. Uh, how long you can, uh, maybe four years, three years, the vesting rights that we need to define. The volatility, uh, how much the share price is going to be volatile during that period. The dividend yield and the risk-free rate of interest. So these are the six components that, that are required to do an option pricing model. Uh, now we come to the third approach, that is cost approach. Uh, cost approach is basically generally used uh, when there's a liquidation happening, uh, 
when the assets or when the company is in the liquidation process or if the assets are can be easily replaced or if uh, dcf i mean income approach or market approach cannot be used that easily at that time we use the cost approach um, it has two methods reproduction cost and the replacement cost reproduction cost means the cost to reproduce that asset uh, suppose if 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 you are planning to discard that asset and then how long it will take and how much it will cost us to reproduce that asset that is reproduction cost method and another comes is the replacement cost method uh, suppose if you are planning to discard an asset then of this that asset of the similar kind at what rate at in at in the market is available to us that becomes a replacement cost of that asset so this is the cost approach i mean so these were the three different approaches and there are various other methodologies involved in valuation but uh, if i talk about the approach these are the only three approaches that is cost approach income approach and the market approach that can be used in the business valuation uh so coming to the end of my presentation uh uh if i talk about it, uh, valuation in in a I mean, my language it's kind of dating i mean ek dating ki tarah hai there are can be a very rosy uh, valuations of the rosy pictures the rosy figures can be there but the substance uh, the core has to be seen very thoroughly uh, what discounting rate or what the terminal value what factors what qualitative factors are being used in valuation and how substantive are those factors bagged with the facts of the figures so that has to be considered uh, in valuation and not just the rosy picture thank you thank you very much that's all from my side thank you sir thank you so much it was really very nice to hear about the business valuations and uh, your practical approach and uh, you know you know you enlightened us regarding this topic thank you so much the questions we'll take up at the end as of now let me introduce our second speaker let me let us move towards the second session of this webinar dear friends as you know that msme sector has been an underrated child of the indian economy but as per the current government's initiative and incentives to to the msme sector it is contributing immensely to the gdp of the nation so to further elaborate on the role of a chartered accountant in the msme sector i welcome i welcome our second speaker mr nitin ladies and gentlemen see you nitin mehta is a way uh, he is a trained civil lawyer who handles Relate, uh, who handles matters related to land, money recovery, corporate law, including mergers and acquisition. He has also specialty in intellectual property rights and commercial arbitrations. He has been appointed as the youngest senior standing counsel by CBDT to represent Income Tax Department in Gujarat High Court. Dear sir, we welcome you to the webinar. Please carry on. Over to you, sir. Nitin sir over to you yeah hope i'm audible yes sir you are audible yeah so i uh, thank you uh, for having me over with this entire uh, enlightened bunch of chartered accountants uh this is a monologue this is going to be a monologue in that sense at least for uh, some time and possibly i await my chance of learning uh from you all uh during the question answer session i will only start with respect to what steve jobs once said great things in the business are never done alone but with the team of people i can only say that cas 
are that team for msme which can turn challenges into opportunities and dreams into realities now let me justify why i say so i may uh, now share the screen for my ppt presentation uh yes so hopefully it is uh, visible yes sir it is visible yes uh now why cas would be a catalyst in the legal and financial resilience and recovery of msme is something which we will understand in next 40 45 minutes now first to understand why msme and why are we holding this but in a 4 o'clock on a weekday is because of the immense contribution which msme has made to our country just to have some figures before you the gdp growth around 30% is contributed by msme they manufacture around 6000 numbers of different products their manufacturing output is approximately around 45% their exports are in between 40 to 48% and they employ around 12 crores of uh, of 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 the employed uh, citizens of our country No sir Nitin sir please check your audio Manish, can you rejoin? Nitin sir, are we audible to you? Please rejoin the meeting. He is just rejoining, Rana. There is some technical glitch going on. Okay. He is rejoining. Ladies and gentlemen, we we apologize for this technical uh, glitch happening in between the meeting. It will soon uh, start restart.
No, sir, you are not audible. There are approximately 980 members who are uh, live with us on this webinar. And I apologize on behalf of CPE committee for this technical glitch happening. We will soon sort it out and we will continue the session with Nitin sir. Am I audible now? Am I audible now? Am I audible? Yes, now? yes, sir. You are audible. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. I'm extreme. I'm extreme. I'm extreme. I'm extremely sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, we had tested that particular system, but I don't know. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. You're perfectly audible. Please continue. Uh, extremely, extremely sorry, everyone. I'll just try to share my screen and uh, uh, start. So I, I was just going through the importance of importance of uh, the chartered accountants in the MSME sector and also highlighted how and why the MSME sector is so pivotal to our economy. Uh, so, is it Yeah. Uh, the slideshow is visible on the screen. Yes, sir. Visible. Yeah. Okay. So this is the kind of contribution MSME has. Now, what does the chartered accountant have to? Uh, okay. So this is your statement of ICI on its website, how does it believe it plays an important role in MSME sector with respect to the chartered accountants? So they say that 
you are a trusted financial advisor and provide services like project financing, management, budgetary financing, modeling, all these, which you are, you are very good at. And therefore, I'm not entering into any of these fields at all. I would be looking at from the perspective of probably like an NRI who will be uh, seeing the country grow from outside, though it will not be a, any tangible benefit to it, to him. But the kind of role the chartered accountant would play, I am looking at it from the legalistic perspective. That what is the legal requirement of MSNE and how do the chartered accountants play a cat catalyst role while providing and satisfying the le such legal requirements of MSNE. So I have divided into four categories broadly. First is the structuring services. Second is one-time licensing, licensing and work and registration services. Third is periodic compliances and fourth is stakeholder services. Now structuring services, as you are aware, any organization or any client of yours who comes to you has essentially four roles or has a is in a particular stage of its uh, of its business cycle it may be a start startup or it will be starting up it will be beginning or it has achieved a level where it is expanding its existing uh, projects or for matter that uh, for that matter geographical reach and third is diversifying into new particular products or new business lines once you understand that the stage at which your client, which is an MSME is, you will have to help him plan a, 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 a model and a business plan according to his long-term perspective and the kind of market which he is wanting to reach. So the first point which has to be uh, considered is your advice as to its legal status and the kind of organization which it would want to have. So as we all know, uh, various forms, maybe proprietorship, partnership, uh, LLP, company, or many other such, uh, be it in HUF, you'll be doing business in HUF. So multiple status of the organization can be there, which you will have to advise him based on various parameters, tax, his long-term plans, the other partners involved, the kind of liability and the risk which a particular uh, industry will entail upon. So more the risk, it would be uh, better for, uh, for a thing like a limited liability, like a LLP or for that matter, company. And then the strategy to run around it. For example, the legal requirement of taxation if it is an individual HUF, you have certain benefits under Income Tax Act, under 44 AB, AD, AB, TDS provisions uh, are relaxed for individuals in HUF. Partnerships will again have 44 AD, presumptive taxation will be available, but that the same will not be available for a company. So these are the parameters which you'll have to consider. Now we come to the second limp of the service category of services, which is one time licensing and registration services, which includes uh, various kinds of registration, but that is one-time registration, maybe a tax registration, GST number, PAN number, IPR registrations, uh, labor laws registrations, manufacturing licenses, most importantly, a MSME registration, and there are almost uh, 132 license and registrations, which may be required depending upon the nature of the business of your client, of that particular MSME. So, here missing out one would be a fatal would be fatal for him both in terms of statutory penalty and at time criminal proceedings or maybe commercially uh, suicidal for him i'll just share one example uh, so there was this uh, client who actually was originally registered as an ssi in uh, in 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 its uh, in its original avatar way back in 94 95 but with the new act of 
2006, which came up, which required a fresh registration. He was not aware about it. And believe me, he his around 90 crores is on stake because of not being advised to re-register himself under the new act. So such things are very, very important and can uh, provide, uh, can, can be a kind of a life and death for a particular MSME. Then is periodic compliances, which you all are so uh, well aware about, especially the tax compliance, direct, indirect, then labor laws, their environmental laws, their corporate laws, their FEMA, SB, SEBI and RBI. So essentially periodic compliances, I am dividing it into two categories. One is statutory and second is contractual. Now, just to give you an example of a contractual uh, compliance, uh, there are multiple contracts long term which are entered from, for example, there was one client of ours who entered into a franchise con franchise agreement and had an all India franchise of a very, very uh, big brand. So he developed the business for them for 10 years, popularized the brand in India. And eventually in the 11th year, the brand thought that we should diversify and not stick to only one uh, all India franchise. So they found out a very small two letter clause in the agreement, which come, which provided for the, uh, the, the MSME to actually provide for the balance sheets to be supplied over the years after they are filed with the respective tax authorities or the statutory authorities to the principal. So all what was required to be done was that a balance sheet once finalized was to be couriered to the principal. Now he received a contract, he received a, a notice from uh, the principal with respect to the breach of the condition and was his franchise was terminated because of that uh, breach which was recurring in nature because after executing the contract the uh, the msme never looked at that again so therefore uh, just, this is just one example where the contracts will have to be looked at uh, as as one of the services provided by cas who will prepare do's and don'ts or a checklist which has to be regularly followed by the uh, client for his own benefit. Then comes direct, indirect, which you all are aware about. Then these are the labor laws, compliances, which are required, which are statutory and have uh, both penal uh, provi provisions in terms of uh, huge penalties and in terms of uh, criminal actions also initiated against the uh, employer or the occupier, as they say, under the act, which is so very important for you to advise an MSME who can be a one-man army for his own business. Or even if it is a multi-people-driven uh, multi organization, not necessarily they are aware about each and every laws. Uh, these are environmental law opportunities, which in fact, ICA website uh, has put across for the chartered accountants to look at and maybe uh, develop a practice on certification work. Next is the stakeholder services, which is the last category. If you look at the organization structure of, uh, of any, of any organ of for that matter, any client of yours, you will see that there are five stakeholders. First being the promoter, second being the employee, third being the customers or a data, fourth being a vendor and fifth being a financer. Now, in each of these categories, actually, there can be much guidance and services value added, which can be provided by uh, the chartered accountants. Like, again, I am restricting myself to the legal implications in all these uh, categories. For example, the promoter, the first thing any promoter or any uh, organization will do is come to a chartered accountant to either prepare a MA or a memorandum of article or, <coughs> or the 
इनकॉपरेशन डॉक्यूमेंट डीड पार्टनरशिप डीड और एम ए और ए सो गॉन आर द डेज सर वेन देर वॉज अ कॉपी पेस्ट डन वेयर बाय यू हैड अ प्रफोमा एम ए और ए अवेलेबल टू यू और अ पार्टनरशिप अग्रीमेंट विच वॉज अवेलेबल टू यू विच यू वुड जस्ट विथ चेंज ऑफ यू नेम्स it has been almost 100 years since our companies act has been prevalent there are lot many clauses of article and memorandums which have tested which have been tested in the uh, in the court which have been interpreted and that interpretation needs to be understood by the chartered accountants and accordingly the clauses needs to be modified then the in comparison to the performa invoices i have come across most of the partnership uh deeds are drafted by chartered accountants with a perspective of income tax planning their interest remuneration and profit accordingly but this is a document where the marriage is happening and the sustenance sustenance of the marriage is completely is completely dependent upon the incorporation document like a partnership which must contain do's and don'ts which must contains the the broad uh, corners within which the partners will have to act their responsibility in everything there may be a clause of arbitration in that there may be a clause of dispute resolution in any which other way so all these things are so very important which will help the promoters to uh, look at at the time of their inconvenience or at the time of any dispute just giving a very quick example there was a case which uh, there was one client of ours who came to us for an advice with respect to a 20 years old partnership firm um our first question is how is your partnership doing very badly he said no it is making huge profit and every year we are making a a, a compounded profit of of 10% and above then obviously the question what is the problem the problem between the two partners was that one partner was anticipating a huge jump in sales and profits and therefore wanted a huge investment to be made while the second partner was not as optimistic or would say that he was more conservative and wanted a conservative approach which with less expans expansion and less investment in the partnership and he would want to uh bifurcate the the entire investment over the years this in a running concern making of it ended up in a dispute between the partners when we looked at the partnership deed it contained nothing with respect to uh the kind of investments the kind of uh, who will prevail when such disputes would arise what would be the percentage and so on and so forth of the sharing of profits if there is an uneven uh, capital investment so and so forth now second comes with respect to employees so with respect to employees we today are facing every day again i'll i'll give you an example which we have uh, come across so there was this client of ours who had come rushing uh, uh, saying to us that sir this i need to file a immediate injunction against one of our uh, employees that is this employee who was uh, who was just graduated from a small uh, city of india he was brought into the firm he was taught everything about this uh, uh, this uh, uh, a particular japan japan and south korean region he did not even have a passport the passport was made everything was taught to him with respect to the market with respect to the products uh, of 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 this client of ours and after 5 6 years of employment he is now going out of the organization joining a competitor with all the data uh, from from the from our client now it will completely destroy my client's business if this employee succeeds in taking away the data and all of that so the simple queries which we post that what are the documents to uh, 
evidencing what you were just saying that uh, what every everything with what you were saying what is the evidence he did not even have the simplest of the document like appointment letter forget the terms forget the do's and don'ts forget the uh, forget evidencing the steps or kind of training which has been given to the employee uh, with respect to all this it took us one month to actually put the house in order before we could file a injunction and by that time a lot was lost so again service level agreements helping chart helping the helping the msmes to uh, provide do's and don'ts to provide uh, uh, proper appointment letters proper termination uh, letters agreements uh, non compete clauses is something which you can always advise in terms of employees who are a very important stakeholders now with respect to customers so with respect to customers i believe cs are the king in the sense that no one can no professional can advise better to a client or uh, an msme than the cs with respect to the customers right from in fact drafting a particular drafting a invoice i am sure uh, in our old times we used to have that green pen Uh, which we used to use to tick mark various things, uh, tally the ledger, which nowadays are not there. I'm told, but invoices are so basic in any of your audits. But I am sorry to say that multiple times we come across invoices which are badly drafted, which do not contain uh, the terms properly, which do not depict. the jurisdiction we do not depict that there may be a interest which is chargeable they do not depict the credit period which will be available and therefore your first job with client is to add, with respect to the customers is starts from proper drafting of the uh, invoice second obviously setting the entire uh, system of proper purchase order proper delivery uh, chalan uh, drafting the delivery chalan which is also very important today uh, with gst uh, you it has been replaced by online uh, but again that also adds up to your responsibility because the poor msme is absolutely unaware about uh, all these aspects especially when it comes to the uh, the portal of gst and therefore is much dependent upon you so right from uh, invoice then comes uh, the debtors uh, when a uh, when when you when the customer i believe in even today's time there is a aging schedule of debtors which you take from the client so immediately when you see there are the a debtor is outstanding since 6 months your antenna should really uh, go out and it is time for you to inquire from your client as to why it is outstanding since so long what are the reasons whether any steps have been taken for him to ensure that the recovery happens if there is any legal steps which is required to be taken what are the kind of correspondence which have uh, been uh, uh, undertaken by your client with respect to this uh, these daters all these are so very important and are the basis for any successful litigation if at all in future it so happens for recovery of these amounts now let me shift to the creditors now, one of the biggest problem with respect to creditors is the scope of work when a creditor in the sense of supplier or vendor is is hired then the scope of work the kind of specific specifications which are required in a purchase order given by your client to someone else or a scope of work which has been drafted or a work order which is given is so vague that the expectations are very difficult to meet between 
both the supplier and uh, and the buyer and it entails to a lot of litigation eventually this is so true in with respect to the services where obviously the goods are undefined they are not specified their services which are all uh, intangible in nature in that sense and the expectations run high while at the same time the the supplier or the vendor or the service provider is 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 uh, having a complete different interpretation of the scope of work and leads to a lot many a lot of litigation this is also very important in case of tendering work where tenders have to be interpreted and a sub contract or a sub tender will have to be done for example there are uh, huge infrastructure companies like lnt and so and so who bid for 1000 crores of uh, of a tender but then they and which for a tender document which runs somewhere into 500 uh, 500 pages and so on but then they subcontract that 1000 crore contract into maybe 20 25 crores of subcontracting to msmes now it can be either two ways the msme can be levied with uh, all the liability in that 500 pages of contract which poor msme has never read and what all he has is two page of work contract uh, which he signs uh, from a big company so you will have to understand and make your make that msme understand that the scope of his liability under a work order which he is getting and accordingly probably correspond uh, correspond with uh, with with the ultimate uh, ultimate customers of his or ultimate supplier of uh, theirs uh, with respect to what would be the scope and what would be the legal liability as well as the 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 checkpoints in terms of uh, the the dates at on which certain work has to be achieved uh, so there again chartered accountants play a pivotal role now financiers uh, being the last stakeholder uh, least said the better i think you all are very very, very well, well versed but with it but what we have seen in our experience is that a client has all the assets in the world to be able to get the finance but when it actually comes to getting a finance the documents are not in order he has a huge chunk of land which he has bought but the but the land is not in his name or not in the name of the organization they cannot be a, it cannot be given as a collateral uh, uh, there may be a family dispute running with respect to a particular asset which is uh, which is to be given as collateral or for that matter it may have uh, multiple uh, multiple family members as owners uh, which may not be documented properly so all these things uh, is very very important for getting a quick finance quick and easy finance and also at a good rate i believe you all are uh, are are brilliant at uh, financing and arranging financing for msmes but i am with respect to the documentation with respect to that again uh, we see a lot of today in global uh, global trade lcs bank guarantees these are common instruments which are actually used by uh, businessmen to uh, do their daily transactions where uh, probably an msme signs on the dotted line without understanding the implications of the same without understanding the terms of the same therefore it is the chartered accountants who should who should enter uh, into advisory role to interpret and make the uh, make the client understand with respect to the risk which he is entering into and probably advise him to negotiate the change in certain clauses of uh, such bank guarantees uh, such uh, lcs and so and so forth instruments uh, with this i now turn to the essential elements which have been listed 
as to why there have been closures of closure of small sector units. If you see, this is very, very important. If you see the problem, only once you identify the problem, you can uh, find a solution to the same. So the biggest problem is financial problem. Second is marketing, raw material. Disputes among the owners are uh, around 3.7% uh, where uh, there has been a closure. Labor problems and, and a combination of all these. So I would believe a financial problem a uh, marketing problem i understand is may not uh, may not lie in your domain but a uh, financial dispute among the owners labor problem in terms of uh, settling with the labor or negotiating with uh, the labor unions and getting a settlement agreement done are coming in uh, absolute area practice area of the chartered accountants now i would here try to now focus on with respect to the financial problem and also uh, a very small area of the financial problem which is that out of these 34.7% a huge chunk of MSMEs have gone uh, into, uh, into a closure because of their inability to recover amount from their debtors. So once they are not, they have used debtors, unable to recover money, liquidated them and therefore un unable to pay their creditors or pay bank loans for that matter. Especially this is so true in infrastructure companies. Uh, so I will try to concentrate now as to what you all can do for recovering the uh, amount which your which an MSME uh, is, is, is uh, liable to receive. Uh, so these are the four forums, uh, these are five forums within which a recovery can take place. First is a commercial suit. Uh, there is a separate commercial act which has, which has uh, been uh, uh, promulgated by uh, the present uh, dispensation which expedites all other past, uh, if it's a commercial suit, if it's a commercial dispute, it expedites the entire uh, process of a uh, ordinary court and commercial courts have been set up in 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 almost all jurisdictions which have pecuniary limit above which uh, it will come in that court they are designated judges who understand uh, matters commercially and are uh, equipped uh, to deal with them expeditiously second is arbitrations which you all would understand that arbitrations are only possible if there is a clause of arbitration in an agreement. Generally speaking, uh, in terms of everyday invoicing, there is no arbitration clause. And therefore, this is only in terms of such bigger contracts which your an MSME or a client will enter into. Third is the most Im important and very unique, which is MSME Act and reference under that particular act for recovery of the dues of your client. Fourth is, yes, uh, NCLT. Uh, we'll come to that also. In NCLT, if your amount is, if your debt is more than a crore rupees, then only you are, uh, as an MSME, you will be able to file an NCLT proceedings against, uh, against a corporate debtor and restricted to the debtor who's a corporate only. And lastly, finally, is that if nothing works, then it's a regular summary suit which you will have to file in a civil court which even today takes ages. So uh, let me concentrate right now and take you on the MSME Act and how chart accountants can play a very important role. So uh, there are uh, till 2022, almost 66 six lakhs units were registered uh, uh, in that Udyan, uh, Udyan port portal, out of which uh, maximum were micro, very, uh, very, very uh, minimal were uh, small and minuscule were medium enterprises. And therefore, you see how big is this MSME sector. Now, uh, with all, the, all of them registered, so first advice would be to ask them to register on this Udyam portal, which is very simple. 
there are multiple benefits which i for the uh, shortage of time i may not uh, right now take you through but uh, i would say that all other benefits of registration is on one side and the other side is simply the ability for the uh, for the msme to recover their their dues from their debtors or for the uh, matter for from their buyers uh, expeditiously and with a very high interest rate uh, which will come to so uh, various benefits available just because of one registration on the msme so earlier there were multiple registrations in in various forums which were required but today thanks to ease of doing business this one registration entitles you to subsidy schemes to uh, to priority funding uh, to uh, various grants of the government and so on and so forth now very simple to register there are very few documents which are required uh, which are very easily uh, one can understand while one goes to the portal which in fact chartered accountants should take on them that equally once a chart once they file a man a or they incorporate a company or for that matter partnership deed they must advise equally quickly that the uh, the particular client should get registered under msme now who can get uh, registered under msme uh, any a micro so msme is for micro small medium enterprise so micro would be who has investment so the criteria to find out who would uh, be under this category is two folds one is the plant in investment uh, criteria and second is the turnover criteria so if an investment is less than a crore equal or less than a crore and also the turnover is uh, is 5 crores or uh, less then you will be considered as micro with respect to small the investment in plant and machinery will be 10 crores and turnover would be 50 crores medium would be 50 crores in uh, as an investment and 250 crores as a turnover so this you as as you see on the slide the old old definition had very small uh, uh, limits and most of today's business and turnovers would uh, would be beyond Uh, these particular definitions, and therefore the amend, therefore in uh, this particular definitions were amended <laughs> under the new act. Now, uh, how do you figure out that uh, if suppose you have two three units, then what each unit will be considered separately? The guidance has come in form of uh, clarification, which says that. Uh, which which goes goes on the basis of gst and number if you have one gst number based on the permanent account number then all such units will be collectively considered cumulatively and their aggregate value of investment and turnover will be considered to find out the category in which they fall now what as investments have to be in plant and machine and equipment so how do you calculate the value of plant machine in old uh in old act or in fact in the new act in 2006 also uh there was this circular the act does not define uh, how do you compute the plant and machinery but there was a clarification which was given that earlier the computation of investment in plant and machinery was to be based on the purchase value or for that matter the cost of a plant and machine so as we all know the depreciation there will be the the uh, there will be a huge depreciation which will take place but the cost will not uh, come down the historical cost will never come down and therefore because of additions of plant and machinery many of the enterprises uh, went outside the uh, the scope of msme because though their machines were old and depreciated they added new machineries but it was not the wdv but it was the historical cost which was considered such this thing was rectified in 2020 uh by a clarification which said that now it is the 
block or it is the block of plant and machinery as per the income tax rules which will be considered for purposes of determining the investment value so if it's a new undertaking which has no uh, past or record or history then it will be based on self declaration as to the value of plant and machinery uh, which will entitle it to uh, register itself as msme and for anyone else uh, automatically the figures of uh, of 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 the slab of income tax with respect to plant and machine will be taken by the portal the portal will directly link itself to the pan number uh, pan number and will automatically compute the value of plant and machinery and categorize the unit as either micro medium or uh, small <laughs> uh now this will happen automatically uh with respect to the turnover this will be based on the turnover which you show in the gst and return on the portal and it will automatically take except for the first year uh, where obviously there is no past record and this will be taken off the previous year uh, way uh important question was that uh today uh, any trader any retailer would fall under the category of msme earlier this was not permitted as it was only a manufacturer or a service provider which could avail msme benefits but uh, in 2021 this particular circular came by which a wholesaler and a retail trader was also entitled to msme benefit in terms of registration of it but the benefit was limited to priority sector lending only now there are uh, interpretations to the effect that could it could a could a retailer or a wholesale trader take the entire benefit of uh, of the msme uh, act in terms of section 17 18 19 which will come or it is only with respect to there are two interpretations to it not entering into it but it's a debatable area because of the uh, definition which will just come okay so uh, just as traders a chartered accountant which is a firm and not an individual practitioner so it has to be enterprise it is msme enterprise so a individual may not be uh, considered as an enterprise and therefore a enterprise will be entitled even if a ca firm will be entitled to register itself uh, as msme uh now buyers whether the uh, location of buyer is immaterial in the sense that uh, even if uh, the the buyer is unregistered even if the buyer is not an msme it hardly matters for the benefits to be taken so it we, the only definition of buyer is that he should he should buy goods and services from a supplier for consideration uh now what is a supplier is defined in 2n which is very important definition which has uh, if you see uh, it is both a definition uh, which is inclusive and in and 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 has means also so it has four limbs of to the definition there were uh, there are various judgments on these issues with respect to whether the issue came that Uh, who will be a supplier? Because uh, being a supplier, uh, if you see that he has he has to file a memorandum under Section Eight One of MSME Act. So uh, MSME Act, we immediately come to what MSME Act Section Eight is a memorandum which uh, states about memorandum gives details with respect to registration on the portal. that is what a memorandum uh, or is all about so a uh, question is only if someone registers would he be a supplier or uh, someone who otherwise qualifies for an msme in terms of turnover investment criteria but not registered uh, will still be termed as a supplier so there were uh, sets of judgments right from uh, right from uh, gt the uh, limited of delhi and various multiple judgments which actually held that registration under 8 section 8 is not necessary 
for some for for an msme to be considered as a supplier it is not mandatory it uses the word may it it is not uh, it, it it is it is only recommendatory in nature and uh, if he does it then he will get certain benefits but that doesn't mean that if he does not get it he ceases to be an msi he still continues to be an msi he continues to be a supplier that was interpretation given by uh, many judgments so uh, 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 in ramki the delhi high court held that the definition has four categories and is exhaustive and it's not necessary for such entities to have filed a memorandum under section 8 and so was the view of andhra pradesh high court but bombay high court deferred bombay high court said that the registration will not give you a retrospective application and therefore uh, the benefit cannot be taken by a by by uh, someone by a msme uh, when he is not registered so a contract entered when an msme was not uh, a registered under the act will not be considered as a supplier under section 2f so there were multiple disputing judgments whereby uh, finally uh, again i may not say finally but there is uh, this judgment of shilpi industries uh, by supreme court and gujarat state civil Sup uh, supplies corporation which of supreme court which in that sense has uh, concluded the issue uh, to the limited extent stating that it is only upon registration that the benefit under the act will be available so if you are not if you are an msme you, though you are an msme but if not registered then you will not get and only after the date of registration will you get the benefit now the issue to the right that what would be the date suppose if i got a contract on uh, 1st january 2022 and i get registered myself on uh, let's say 31st uh, december 2022 so and still continue to supply goods till six more months so whether for the supplies made for that entire year when i was unregistered uh, though when the conclusion of the contract was there i was registered what would happen would i be able to claim the benefit of the supplies made prior to the date of registration or only post uh, thereafter there are multiple issues the date of registration has to be calculated on the date of contract on or on the provision of services on or on the provision of uh, supply of uh, or or on the raising of invoices or possibly on the date of dispute arising or on the date on which uh, i may i may want to avail or file certain references which will come to under the act so there are multiple dates things are not clear but however today the last word is what supreme court says is that prior to the date of registration you can't take which is the date is something which we'll have to still a uh, debate upon uh, so there are uh, because of the paucity of time i will quickly not go deep into it but just take you to the to the integrities uh, of of the particular act except to the extent that section 8 is section 8 section 15 16 is where the entire msme act it has been uh, promulgated to ensure that there is a quick recovery and payment made to msmes by all these big individuals so uh, big uh, corporations which would take the msmes to a ride and because of a very shallow uh, financing which an msme act msme has uh, it may uh, end up uh, into a closure and create unemployment situation so uh, section 15 says that the it is liable for every buyer to pay an msme within 45 days so even if your contract states that the 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 credit period available is let's say 60 days but section 15 says that the credit period has to be 45 days if it is if in the contract it is less then obviously less but uh, it can be greater than 45 days post 
on the from the 46th date the uh, the interest component starts and the act comes into play uh, so interest uh, the best part of the entire act is section 16 which says that if you are unable to pay on uh, if you are unable to pay within within the time stipulated then you the buyer will have to pay at the compound interest with monthly rest three times of the bank rate which almost comes anything between 20 to 25 percent in uh, depending upon the fluctuation of the bank rate uh, in in last uh, three four years so this is a statutory interest it is not a contractual interest your contract may have no interest clause still under section 16 statutorily the buyer is bound to pay a msme supplier interest at this high a rate now how do you recover so buyer shall be liable to pay the amount with interest uh, 18 is where the mechanism is provided to recover the principal as well as the interest is where there is a reference which has to be made to this council uh, who will first conciliate between the parties and if the conciliation fails then under section 19 it will uh, it will uh, it will re refer the matter for arbitration now arbitrations uh, can arbitration reference can be the appointment of arbitrator and reference could be on its own or it could give to any institution or it could give to an institution like a like a, instead of chartered accountants i have from all the platforms uh, voicing uh, my request to the institute to register itself under section 19 with various msme uh, councils uh, setting up an arbitration reference council uh, wing in ICI by which under section 19 such matters can be referred to institute chartered accountants who then can have its own rules um, for arbit for uh, for the procedure governing the arbitration as well as right to appoint arbitrators which can also be chartered accountants after all this is a commercial dispute which is best understood by chartered accountants uh, other than obviously the MSME himself. Uh, so, section 19, uh, once an uh, once the conciliation fails and a uh, arbitration is uh, is is evoked, award is received under section 19, which is again very beautifully crafted to say this that a award can only be challenged by a by a buyer only if he pays 75 percent of the awarded amount and therefore it unlike a particular unlike a typical litigation which extends over multiple years this would really be only with respect to uh, the amount will be received by the by the supplier the msme and therefore his business will not be hampered uh, again the definition uh, 20 Three, section 23 for CSR material because the interest paid under MSME will not qualify as a reduction under Income Tax Act, which is, you can understand, 20 to 25 percent. And if if uh, the the uh, amount due is over two, three years, it it cross possibly is interest is equal to the amount of debt. Overriding effect. Then quickly, uh, how much time do I have, uh, ma'am? So we have already done this. another rough, uh, another five minutes. You, yeah, yeah, sure. Continue. Okay. So this next, this is MSME Act. So next uh, way of recovery of your dues for MSME is insolvency and bankruptcy court. Uh, if above one crore, you can file as an operating creditor under section uh, application under section nine, uh, where the debtor is a corporate. And you can recover, you can have multiple process uh, in go, you can go to NCLT, even chartered accountants are entitled to uh, to appear before NCLT. Uh, and it's a big practice area. 
today ips uh, our insolvency professionals are appointed who will take over the management of the corporate data run the show and possibly liquidate the assets and provide the amount to msme uh, as an msme you don't want this ha to happen it is a very uh, good way to bring the the debtor on table to negotiate and again there is where chartered accountant plays a pivotal role to help the client negotiate and not to prefix him with the exact amount of debt and interest which he is entitled to so last is where the mse msme itself is under financial duress where pre packaged insolvency process which is again provided under the ibc act uh, ibc code is uh, of immense importance it is a subject in itself but i can only leave you uh, with a glimpse of i can only leave leave you with the uh, with with an example say that the banks are more than happy for uh, getting into this prepackaged insolvency process because this is best of both the worlds bank get what they what they want and the promoter or the msme really gets the time period uh, and and a statutory uh, impromptu for uh, a ots kind of a proposal or for uh, a financial proposal which he is willing to comply with uh, over a particular period it requires 75% of stakeholders uh, 66% of financial creditors in value and uh, finally the contract act is uh, something which again is uh, something which is very material on which you can uh, advise on agreements and finally if uh, it's a bank loan then your client or msme would be facing music under rdb act or securitization act where again you will play a pivotal role in advising them with respect to correspondence with calculating the claim uh, falsifying uh the claim of the bank in terms of the calculation which they have done and helping them or guiding them to the correct uh correct resource person like an advocate or any other person who can fight their case uh, at a right time before they have cut their hands and uh, thrown it away before they can defend themselves in a court of law and finally is uh, factoring regulation which again uh, is in itself but i would probably uh, end up there and thank you for a uh, patient uh, hearing i will only end up by saying this that as um, mahatma gandhi has said that uh, uh, it is it is not only uh, we who can act alone it is a cumulative effort which is required and today the chartered accountants will have to really guide and i think they are the backbone of this economy and specifically msme who could not stand erect without the help of chartered accountants and therefore i uh, i i really request you all to brush up the skills other than your audit and tax skills to help your clients especially those who are msm thank you thank you so much sir for enriching us with uh, msme knowledge so deeply thank you so much uh, here are a few questions from our members uh, first somil sir uh, there are some questions for you i would read it out for you uh, out of the three approaches of valuation how do we decide which approach is to be adopted while valuing a particular business somil sir over to you uh, right um, so ideally in this case um, when whenever the company is a going concern first we talk about the income approach so whenever the company is a going concern and limited availability of data is there yeah. or if we say that uh, the projections of the financial the expectation of the group company wherein the financials or the growth prospects are very high uh, at that time uh, it is always better to use a dcf approach because it is kind of internal uh, calculations internal evaluation of the company by the promoters wherein where the business would stand uh, market approach can be used at that time when the uh, comparable datas are easily available uh, when the similar companies in the market segment 
or uh, like quoted companies are easily available and if we get the data for the multiples at that time we can use the market approach uh simultaneously both the uh, approaches can be used to evaluate if both the data are available and we can have a weighted average or average out the both the approaches to arrive at a particular valuation and for the cost approach if i talk about then cost approach is generally used when the company uh, is going to terminate its operation or uh, the it is in under the liquidation process at that time we use the cost approach which is which is also known as asset approach method uh, because in both market multiples and in income approach we consider intangible assets as well uh, as i had said in my uh, presentation the ev the enterprise value considers both uh, the net tangible assets as well as the intangible assets while in cost okay. approach Quickly, quickly benefits. taking up the next question, sir. What should be the idle rate for DCF valuation? What should be the idle rate for the DCF valuation, sir? For the idle rate, uh, DCF, first and foremost, the cash flows, the future cash flows of the company has to be determined very correctly. Uh, then there are some subjective factors like uh, terminal growth rate, uh, the risk-free return, and the VAT, the cost of equity and debt. The, that is VAT has to be calculated by, uh, or to be come uh, at means it has to be derived in a very good manner to have a DCF calculation. Sorry, you are muted. Uh, okay. How to calculate the enterprise value of unlisted public company? Enterprise value. Enterprise value, again, enterprise is both the equity and debt. So when we arrive at the free cash flows, we arrive at the free cash flows of the firm. Uh, so that includes both the equity and the debt. We don't reduce the interest component in that case. We calculate on the EBITDA perspective. And all the similar factors of terminal value, uh, VAT and uh, uh, risk-free rate of return has to be used to arrive at the enterprise value. Commission was all the present value of the net cash flows of the projected period. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Few questions for Nitin, sir. Nitin, sir, benefits of bank loan for MSME, any concession in the service charges? Is there any concession in the service charges? Uh, not, it, it again depends upon each bank uh, and, and their policies. Though government is giving interest subsidies, on uh, with respect to uh, investments in plant and machinery, which has to be availed by way of uh, 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 loan, uh, by way of an application with respect to subsidy. So that is what I'm aware about. Okay. One more question is there, but uh, I don't think it has a practical uh, applicability, but I'll ask, how could we ascertain the MSME status of the vendor in case the company is not providing any information? That's a very nice question. In fact, if you go on the portal today, you will find the list of all registered uh, MSME MSMEs on it. And there you will be able to find out whether your vendor is an MSME or not. Today, and as you are aware, as chartered accountants, you will also have to, there's a disclosure requirement wherein if there's a due from MSME, it has to be specifically disclosed uh, in the financial statements. So to that extent, uh, even if there's no correspondence or for that matter, if your supplier hides from you the status, you can go to the portal and find it out yourself. Thank you, sir. Uh, one question is left for Somil, sir. May I have the permission, sir? Uh, kindly throw some light on project reports submitted to the bank for finance and assumptions are getting a challenge in valuation, the consequences for the business. Some light on the project report submitted to the bank, mm -hmm. bank for finance and what are the assumptions? Project report submitted. So assumptions, uh, all assumptions has to be have some facts. I mean, some derivations from the history or on what basis you have made the assumptions. Uh, like the, if you are predicting the future cash flows, then you need to predict the growth trend of the company, like at what scale it is growing. And if not available easily, then you need to see the peer companies at what stage they are growing. Uh, so 
for that and all the other uh, subjective factors uh, like if we talk about the risk free rate of returns so it it is generally calculated or taking the government bond rates or uh, other factors as well the equity discounting factor so we need to check the similar industry segment wherein the companies are operating and we need to add certain discounting factor based on the uh, pl company ratios so that is very important so uh, challenge might come or they may add the, they may ask the questions but practically we, we need to justify what the valuation what the assumptions we have taken and if it is justifiable then it will be acceptable thank you sir just Dear to members, add here just just to add here with respect yes, sir, to the please. legal perspective eventually if there is any case which happens uh, on assumptions there is a very important disclosure which you should provide and all the factors which can uh, probably affect the your assumption must be in detail specified for any eventual non payment or any eventual case which may happen against you so even such slight legal inputs will help uh, in long term for your client eventually in case if he is defaulting thank you so much sir thank you uh, dear members this seminar this webinar was uh, basically for the purpose of uh, opening up a new avenues for the practicing chartered accountants apart from the traditional practices like one business avenue could be valuing the business the another which we came up is uh, being a catalyst for the msme sector as uh, nitin sir has uh, uh, sh shared with us the statistics that 66 lakh msmes are registered over the msme portal and uh, how we as chartered accountants can uh, you know involve in getting them registered in uh, fulfilling their legal requirements and uh, for compliances with the uh, laws and uh, taxation so this was a very comprehensive webinar on both the aspects which could open the new avenue for us so thank you uh, thank you uh, to both our panelists somil sir and nitin sir for being with us and uh, uh, sh spending your precious time with us thank you so much for the insights you have shared with us I would like to thank uh, Purshottam sir, who has probably left the meeting as he had yet another meeting lined up behind. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all the member participants who spared time for us and uh, joined this webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pragya. Thank you, the technical support, Manish. Thank, thank you, you, Shrey. You. Thank you, Ajit, sir. Thank you, everybody, on behalf of CPE committee. Thank you, ma'am. Just again, you know, I would like to reiterate being a secretary of CPE committee. Yeah, of course, you know, as chairman has said, from last three months, we have started a new initiative for sending, you know, members to customize mail. I hope you are also and the faculty also, other members, all members. They are receiving, you know, customized mail, how many CP hours they have completed, how many are remaining. It might be there are some discrepancies. Of course, for that, we are advising to check in the dashboard of this thing. And if there is any issue, just you, member may reach to us by writing at CP admin at ici.in. It's, a, you know, again a request since this is the December, today we are on 13th. And for this calendar year, the last date is 31st of December 2023. So all please you comply with requisite CP hours under various categories like COP holder, non-COP holder, senior. First year membership, they are exempt. That would I would like to announce. So all please go through requirement of respective category and complete because after 31st December, especially for a structured, you are not able to complete once the data is gone. So again, this is a humble request from office. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for wonderfully moderating this event. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much, you sir. Thank you. Thank you, CP thank you. committee, for uh, making me the moderator for the webinar. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.